um, what I discovered was that a number of you weren't super excited to go home uh, because of what waited for you at home, and quite frankly, how much you preferred it here. And uh, I, everybody's situation is different, uh, but one of the kind of common denominators amongst this was, I like who I am better here at Anchor House than I was when I left home. And um, no matter where you are, like even if you're like, well, I, I, I'm, I'm fine, whatever this and that, um, I think you'll appreciate some of the teaching today because I actually have a Bible teaching to go with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share you a couple of quick stories out of my life, and then I'm going to apply the scripture to it. And then I'm just going to kind of hand it over to you guys uh, maybe to talk, talk, and we can talk about this and maybe have a prayer. And then I thought we'd wrap up in um, communion. So one of the stories goes like this. I know I told you my testimony, but as usual, there's like tons of it left that you haven't heard. And one of the things I kind of treaded lightly on, but I was raised in the party section of San Diego, and I grew up in a partying household. And like all the other idiots I knew, when I went off to college, I was quite the party animal. And Interestingly enough, by the time I got out of college, I wasn't a Christian, but I had quit all alcohol and hard drugs, and I just was left with a carryover weed habit, yeah? Uh, as Mike Wellman once said, Jesus saved my soul, but surfing saved my life, and that was kind of me, because what I discovered was drinking and snorting cocaine all night didn't really make you surf real good in the morning, and I was more about surfing than I was partying. So I quit partying, and I was just a hardcore surfer, but I always smoked weed. And then you know that a lot of my testimony, I came here, I get tangled up with this church, I get saved, I become a Christian. And so, like, like you know, Daniel, your story, I was leading a full double life. Now, I want, my story is a little bit different than Daniel's, because you got to remember, I didn't have any Christian background. So I didn't have, like, parents that I would disappoint if they discovered that I was partying. In fact, if anything, just the opposite. My parents thought I'd join some freaky cult, Kauai cult fellowship, yeah? You know, they probably would have been happy to have me continue on as the party idiot that I was rather than some freakazoid born-again Christian, right? Wait, is this thing recording? Don't send this to my parents. But whatever. Um, my point was... I had a huge history behind me and a huge momentum as being Dane, the guy on the beach after surfing, smoking joints with the boys, and I had this weird other little life that was only about one day a week on Sunday mornings at Kauai Christian Fellowship. And then one day, God, in his infinite wisdom and with his sense of humor, made my two worlds combine on the beach out at the base at family housing. What happened was I just got out of the water surfing, my roommate and I, we just rolled a joint, and my friends over here, New York Joe, <laughs> New York Joe, yeah, they're like, hey, guys, we just, we just rolled a joint. And we're like, hey, we just rolled a joint, too. Perfect, we got two. So we actually went to the middle of the two trucks, and about five of us sat down in the sand, and the first joint goes around, like this and that, and when the first joint was over, right between the two joints, a guy by the name of Kyle Maligro came walking by. He was a guy I knew from church, he was one of the worship leaders at church. And he sees me, and he's like, hey, Dane, how's it going? And he comes over, and he sits down next to me. And I'm like, oh, crap. He's one of the church guys, right? And so the second joint gets lit, and it starts going around. And Kyle takes the joint and goes, oh, no, not, me, not thanks. And I go, yeah, not me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you see that? Did you see that little moment right there? And I pass the joint over to the next guy, and nobody seems to really notice. The joint goes around. Kyle leaves. We all pack up our trucks to go. And we're driving up the beach in my truck on the sand, and I look like this, like deer in the headlights. Because all of a sudden, here's what had happened. My two worlds had combined, right, had met on the beach there. And I had to have this thought of, you ready for this? Who am I? Which guy am I? Am I church Dane, or am I <laughs> beach Dane, right? Now, here's what I, the reason I tell you this story. Because um, what I realized in that moment was I was church Dane. And not really church Dane, because that's a really lousy identification, but I really truly believed in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ had come into my life, that he was real, and that my life was going to change because he's real. And so there really wasn't much of a wrestle in my head. And by the way, it would have been easier in the ways of the world to stop going to church and maintain my identity as Dane because most people, frankly, in my life knew me as Beach Dane. Does that make sense? My family, my friends, my surf community, 
my, my church community was small. And as you know, Rick and I know, we've seen people join the church. In fact, we talked about it yesterday, didn't we, in the four soils. The guy who receives with great joy, but he has rocky soil and no root. And so when the sun comes out, that could have been me, except it wasn't me, because I knew deep down who I really was. Now, the key thought in this, just so you know, uh, that was the beginning of my end of my life as a weed smoker, and I'll spare you the rest of the details on that one. But the big part of that great story isn't like, yay, God got Dane off of weed. Because actually, I think that's kind of a, what we call around here a manini thing. You know what the word manini means? Small. It's a small thing, really. Remember we talk about Jesus doing miracles? That kind of stuff for God is like magic tricks. The fact that I quit smoking weed isn't the big part of the story. The big part of the story is the realization of who am I? Who am I really at the core of my being when there's no one around between me and God? And so real briefly, I want to give you a quick teaching on identity in the Bible. And I know some of you know this already. But look what um, Paul writes in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 49. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that came the spiritual. The first man, Adam, was the dust of the earth. The second man, Jesus, is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Do you understand what's going on here? We are born under the sign of Adam. But upon our salvation, we are no longer identified as a son of Adam. We are identified as a son or a daughter of Christ. And so that's why when we get baptized, we make a big deal about, you know, displaying this identity change um, to the world. Because we are now identified as his, okay? So my first challenge for you this morning is, who are you? Are you a son or a daughter of Adam or a son or daughter of Christ? And how does that inform how you live, the choices you make, the people you hang out with, the way you spend your time? Who are you? Okay. Now, secondly, I want to tell you a little interesting little theology about the inner man versus the outer man. Because in Romans 6, Paul says the outer man having been crucified with Christ and having been done away with, but if you remember my teaching on this, that outer man, which is your sinful nature man, the part that was identified with Adam, hasn't been removed. The Greek on that says it has been rendered powerless. So we still carry that outer man, that sinful nature. Everyone in this room still has a sinful nature. But the key word in Romans 6 is that nature has been rendered powerless powerless. It no longer has the power over you. If you are a Christian, you are called no longer a slave to sin, but a slave to righteousness. And so how Paul writes about that is he uses this term inner man and outer man. So look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16. He says, therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So the way I want you to think about this is when I ask you, who are you? To remember that you are not that sinful person anymore. You're not driven by flesh. You might still stumble into temptation and you will be tempted, but you have that inner core, is that inner man, that inner woman. That is the redeemed part of you that actually Romans 6 also says delights in God's law. And according to Paul here, is being renewed and gaining in strength while the outer man is weakening and decaying. So my challenge for you in this section is feed your inner man, your inner woman. Feed your inner man and woman and starve that outer man, that old sinful nature, that part that was still identified with Adam. So in Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, verse 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, put off your old self, that's that outer man, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, 
Second part of today's mini lecture, it's going to be short today, is another story out of my life, and I call it Choose Life. Here's what I mean. By the time I get to Cape and Ray, uh, which is about six or seven years after I become a Christian, so that's sort of my version of going to Anchor House. Does that make sense? Yeah? So pick, put yourself, like, put me in your situation right now, more like... Um, <laughs> Hayden situation, because I was an old dude. I was 31, right? But I'd, I'd been a believer about five or six years. Now, here's the interesting thing. By then, I had put the whole weed thing far behind me, like far behind, four or five years without getting high. Weed wasn't a part of my life anymore, so I wasn't going to Cape and Ray to get out of the weed world or whatever. And in fact, I had another issue, and interestingly enough, I wasn't even aware of my other issue till I got to Cape and Ray. And so I'm just going to tell you what it is. And what it was, was telling dirty jokes and sexual innuendos. You know what sexual innuendos are? Sexual innuendos, I'm going to give you an example of one. If someone says, hey, man, are you going to order the sausage? And somebody else goes, ha, ha, I bet you'd like that sausage. Right? Like, you know what I mean by that? Kind of stupid, but uh, let, a, let alone the classic, so two lesbians and a, and a gay guy walk into a bar, right? Well, I had been raised in that culture, and that was part of my life that I'd had my entire life. And when I was at work, I, I'm pointing this way, because I used to be a bellman at the old Weston, which is now the Sedesta or something like that. And at night, with the, with the bell crew and the valets, we'd all hang out around the front of the Porta Cashier and tell dirty jokes and make sexual innuendos about women when they walked by. Wouldn't you like to ha, 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 right? You know? And even as a Christian... I didn't really even know that was a thing. But here's what happened. I get to Cape and Ray, and without me even realizing it, nobody's doing that at Cape and Ray. Nobody's telling sexual innuendo jokes, and certainly nobody's telling classic dirty jokes. And here's the interesting thing. I really wasn't fully aware of it until, you ready for this? At the end of my year at Cape and Ray, I graduate, and I take the train down to London, and I go visit some friends of mine that I knew from South Africa. They're not Christians, and that's not even part of the story. But we go in, and we, we watch an episode of, are you ready? Friends. You guys like Friends? I still like Friends. Great show. Yeah. And I'm sitting there watching Friends, which I'd watched a million times in my life. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my gosh. This show is wall-to-wall -wall sexual innuendo. That's all it is. It's just a bunch of kind of sexual innuendo jokes about sleeping together and wouldn't you like to and da-da-da. And I'm like, all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I'm super aware of it. And here's the point. I want you to get this. This is really clear. First of all, the point is not this. Oh, that world out there is so evil and, oh, I'm so grateful that I'm so pure. That's not what I mean at all. What I realized was this. I liked Cape and Ray life more than I liked life in the world. That I, I didn't really like sexual innuendo anymore. Like, I just didn't like that. It wasn't me anymore. Something about me had changed while I was at Cape and Ray. And I know that you might find this funny in light of what I just said, but I liked Cape and Ray Dane better <laughs> than I liked Kauai Dane. And I realized I want to live my whole life the way I live life at Cape and Ray, not the guy I was before I got there. So interestingly enough, I got back to Kauai. I got my exact same job back. <laughs> and there I am, not but like, you know, two weeks after arriving back on Kauai, I'm working with the same guys out of the Port of Kashir, and guys are going, hey, check it out, man. Dane, check this out. So two gay guys walk in. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. And they're like, what? I'm like, just go, you know what? I, no thanks. I just don't want, I don't want to hear it. Oh, what are you two guys? I heard all that abuse and everything like that. And here's what I want to tell you about that. Before, old Dane would have been like, well, maybe I shouldn't tell dirty jokes. Maybe I shouldn't listen to dirty jokes. And maybe like when somebody started to tell a dirty joke, if I was like, I'm sorry, I don't want to hear that. I, and they'd be like, why? You think you're better than us? I would have like maybe really cared. No, 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 oh, no. And I would have had this inner turmoil. But you know what I want to tell you? When I got back to that hotel, I had no inner turmoil. You know why? Screw those guys. <laughs> I don't want to live like that. That's not who I am. Does that make sense? Screw those guys. Look at I almost, yeah, okay, screw them. Really? Oh, is that sexual innuendo? Oh, trouble, yeah. You get my point? I don't care what they think about me. I don't want to live like that. I want to live the way I lived for God at Cape and Ray, yeah? I want to live that John 10.10, life abundant life. And so if you like who you are here, 
If you like being the anchor house guy or the anchor house gal, well, no wonder. Why would we be surprised by that? Living for God is truly living. It's life. And so I want you to turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm going to give you the Old Testament version of everything I'm telling you right now. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, Let me set it up for you. Moses is about ready to send the guys into the promised land. Only Moses isn't going to go. And they're going to be surrounded by pagan culture. In fact, that's going to be one of their big downfalls. They're going to go into Canaan, and Canaan is full of Ammonites and Amorites and out of sights and Philistines and whatever, yeah? And this is what he says. So if you start in 28, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but it goes all the way from chapter 28 to chapter 30. But just real quickly, look what he says in in the beginning part of chapter 28. If you fully obey the Lord your God, verse 1, and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations, and all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you. Look at verse 3. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country, and the fruit of your room will be blessed, and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock. Look verse 5. Your basket, your kneading bread trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in. And, you be- and he goes on and on and on. Like everything you touch will be blessed if you just follow me. And then look, skip down to verse 15. However... If you do not obey the Lord your God, and do not carefully follow all his commands and his decrees, look what happens. Verse 16, you'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the country, and your basket and eating bread trough will be cursed, and the fruit of your worm will be cursed, and the crops, and blah, 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 and on all the way down. You see it? And so then, he basically goes on like that for two chapters until you get all the way to the end of, what is it, uh, chapter 30. Skip all the way to chapter 30, and this is his summary And man, if you haven't underlined this in your Bible, you're nuts. 3019. This day, I call heaven and earth as a witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Boom. This day, <laughs> Dane, Pastor Dane, I set before you blessings and curses, life or death. And I want to challenge you today. Choose life. Okay, here's the New Testament version. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 8. Verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And this is what I want to encourage you and challenge you as you leave Anchor House to go home or whatever. It doesn't matter what level of step off or drop off, but I guarantee you God has done something in your life here at Anchor House. He has changed you. You're going home different people. And I want, to, I want to just submit to you, that's who you are. Choose life. Because here's why. Um, you can't stay at Anchor House the rest of your life, right? They tell us when we're at Cape and Ray, you know, we kick you out. You're not welcome to stay at Cape and Ray because you're no earthly good there, right? Yeah? Um, You need to go out and be who God has taught you who you really are while you've been here, yeah? And even if that's like wasn't a new revelation, but a further revelation on that. And so I want to give you some quick quick strategies that are really basic because I'm really just going to wrap up. I've taught you what I want to teach you. The basics, um, even as our brother Daniel said today, I mean, the the basics you knew before you got here. Pray, read your Bible, stay in fellowship, and stay in service. But I want to push you a little bit on that. When it comes to fellowship and service, get up off your butt and go find it. It won't come looking for you. Does that make sense? You can't sit at home thinking, well, I'd like to do some fellowship and some service, but I don't really know, hoping that maybe the Jehovah's will knock on your door, right? Just teasing, right? Hey, are you busy? We need you to drive the van or whatever. Here's what I mean by that. Um, 
churches at Christmas time have lots of stuff going on. They're feeding the poor. They're doing, they need extra help for the Christmas Eve services. Christmas Day this year is on Sunday. They're going to have trouble finding people to like come do church. Go find your local church. Go get involved. Ask where they need help. Find fellowship. Get off your butt and go do it. Remember I told you that story yesterday? My friend from elementary school that ended up getting saved, and I had coffee with him a couple days ago. He just texted me this morning, and he, he invited me over to his house for dinner tonight. So he doesn't live here. His folks have a vacation home here. He's just here visiting. And he said, yeah, Dan, I just got back from my AA meeting. And uh, that's why it took me a while to get a hold of you, whatever, blah, blah. You want to come by? I'll cook some fish tonight. And I'm like, yeah. And he told me this the other day. So here's my point. My friend Bob, he comes here maybe once a year for a couple of weeks. And every single morning that he's here, at 6.30 a.m., he's down at the pavilion at Poipu Beach at the AA meeting. Right? Why? Because he knows where he needs to be. You Christians, you know where you need to be. You're not taking a vacation from God or a vacation from service when you take a vacation from Anchor House. So you have to get off your butt like my friend Bob did. Get up in the morning and go find fellowship and go find a place to serve. Does that make sense? Okay. And then I think that's about it. Uh, Oh, and then the last one is this in terms of... um, Strategy. I want to encourage you all. Uh, when I was at Cape and Riot, we had to write letters. We didn't have <laughs> internet or we didn't have cell phones. So if I wrote a letter to somebody, it was three weeks from there to here and then three weeks. So six week return. Now you guys have like instantaneous communication with each other. And here's what I want to encourage and challenge you to do. Stay connected to each other. I mean, you guys have it so dialed. You can be FaceTiming each other within seconds. You can text within seconds. If you start to struggle, reach out to your Anchor House guys. If you have a moment of victory in your life, tell the Anchor House guys. Help each other through this next few weeks, all right? Okay, Um, does anybody want to add anything, Trent? (laughs) I'm teasing him because I actually asked him yesterday if he would prepare something. And I, I don't mean to put you on the spot like that, bro. Um, who's prepared? Um, I just told Dane, like, uh, just kind of what he just told us. Um, just kind of highlighting like, why it's so important to be Thanks, Trent. I asked him to say that. But does anybody else want to jump in and add anything about how you're feeling about heading home? And, and yeah, go ahead, Nick. Um, one thing, too, is I've always struggled with uh, whenever I try to avoid something, it's usually when I run into it. Okay. Uh, so one thing I've been thinking about, like, I've been trying to pray and ask God, like, what do you want me to do when I go home so that I don't fall back into the sins I was in or that Wow. Yeah. Unreal. I want to I want to experience that. And I want God to like shine for me differently than I did before, right? So uh, one thing to think about is like not just avoiding old habits, but pursuing God like we pursue him here, but like but at home. Like keep reading your four chapters a day, keep praying, uh, like pray with your family. Like that's one thing I don't do enough. Like here we'll go up to each other and like I think it really does everybody all the time. (laughs)
pursue God and keep praying and reading. It's a, it's a great word, Nick. I'd sum it up saying the best defense is a strong offense, yeah? Charge for God, yeah? Yeah, you don't even leave room for the enemy to get in. It's good stuff, yeah? Anybody else? Yeah, John Ann's? Brother Leonard, or Leonard Lawrence, yeah. Brother Lawrence, yeah. Right, beating yourself up, right, yep. Don't beat yourself up when That's something right. goes wrong. Because we're humans, something's yep. probably going to go wrong. It's okay. That's right. <laughs> and then don't feel ashamed to talk with your friends about it. After it happens, go and talk to the people that yes. are Yes, yep. That's what's going to get you through to the other side of it. Yeah? Amen. Okay. Amen. In fact, that's a perfect segue because I thought we'd wrap up today with taking communion. Because um, on the night he was what? Betrayed, yeah, how's that, right? In the thick of doing it, like division and corruption, right? But the interesting thing is, if you think about it, um, right after that all happened, after they took communion, Peter goes right out and does what? Denies Christ three times, right? (laughs) And none of those guys lived a perfect, sinless life for the remainder of their time on earth. But their time with Jesus fundamentally changed them forever so that they were forever bent, as it were, towards Jesus. And granted, yet they didn't yet have the Holy Spirit, but 40 days later they would, or 43 days later, they would. And then they had that indwelling Holy Spirit. And so here, I'm just going to maybe pass this stuff around. Here, go ahead. Yeah, why don't we do this? We'll start the bread this way. And go around that way. But they were new people. And they become new people under the blood of Christ. Does anybody else want to, was, wanted to say something before I, I started talking again? Yeah? Yes, Trisha. I would say, um, I would challenge you guys to create one goal that you really, something you really want to get good at. Like for me, I have a really hard time sitting down and having quiet time. So I would challenge yourself, I would challenge you guys to create a goal and then create steps to accomplish that goal. That's practical good. Practical steps that you can take. So like, for example, if something unpractical is like, I want to go to four hours away to do my work. No, do like, <laughs> sit down. Maybe do just, if you need to start with just five minutes, do five minutes. If you need to start with less, do less. It's the little steps. I don't remember who, I don't remember which speaker said this, um, but they said, why am I not better fast? Like, why can't I be better fast? Faster, yeah, yeah. And, Something I really struggled with was like, I want to be over here, but why am I not here? It's because it's a process, it's a step. We are God's masterpiece, and it takes time to do the paint brushes and the paint. So don't get upset at yourself. Be patient. God's working. I love it. Great stuff, Trisha. And thank you for the true confessions. I love that. Yeah. Struggling with having a quiet time. I, I resemble that remark. Yeah. I do. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Be the last guy. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm, like, lucky that I found, uh, like, a church at home where I have, like, a group of people that are, I'm accountable to. It's just uh, <laughs> the importance of fellowship as we, Spilling um, the blood. as we come here at Anchor House, like, we can all see the importance of having 20, 30 people in our face fellowshipping, pouring into our lives 24-7. So when you go home, if you don't have that fellowship, seek it out. Because mm-hmm. you might have like friends that you're worried to go back to, or maybe you have no friends at all. But that fellowship is so key. Like it's it's really good to have your own personal relationship with the Lord, but I mean he calls us to be in fellowship and we can see the repercussions of us being in fellowship together, how much we've grown. So when you go home, look for that. 
Yeah. Good stuff, really good stuff. Anybody else before we receive? Somebody had their hand up? No? I'll wait for Trisha to come back. Okay, so we hold in our hands here the symbols, yeah? The symbols of what Christ has done for us. He has taken us from darkness and brought us into light. He's taken us from death into life. He's taken us out of the lie and placed us in the kingdom of truth, yeah? This is who we are when we receive this. Because on the night he was betrayed, Jesus, after giving thanks, he took bread and he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink this, drink this in remembrance of me. Let's remember. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is who we are, Lord. This is who we are before you, Lord. We are sinners who have been saved by grace, who have been granted total forgiveness and eternal life in your kingdom because of the blood that you shed on behalf of us. This is who we are. Lord, I pray for every single one of us in this room, Lord, whether we be students or Tony or John or Ben Ryan guys, Lord, this is who we are. And we leave this place, Lord, fully identified with you, God. Help us walk righteously and obediently in front of you, just as your word taught us, Lord, even this week. We hear you, God. We listen to you. We cling to you, God. And we go forth from this place to bear great fruit as lights that are not hidden under a bowl, but lights that instead are put on a table to glorify you, Lord. We ask your help in doing that, Lord. Keep us, Lord, from temptation, God. But should we stumble, Lord, as my brother also taught, Lord, may our repentance be instantaneous, God. And may we uh, come right back before you, right back into fellowship, God, right back into giving you glory. We pray these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, you guys.